Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm Mike. This is Kate. We have two microphones, so we get to argue with each other the whole time. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> we might want to swap because I move around constantly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a good idea. <laughs> so that I'm not tethered. Hey, we agreed on something. Uh, Kate, introduce yourself. So I'm Kate Temkin. I do software stuff at Great Scott Gadgets, supposedly, which means I mostly do hardware things. Uh, I supposedly do software. I've done hardware for the past six or seven weeks, which means I'm not doing my job. I much prefer to talk about the cool things you can do instead of the things that I do. So my job is to make it so that you can do cool things. And on to Mike. And uh, I'm the founder of Great Scott Gadgets and the designer of all the hardware that we sell, although that is changing. Um, and uh, I've really, uh, a big, big part of like my background before I started Great Scott Gadgets was I was super into software defined radio and I was already teaching classes on software defined radio. And that was a big part of, of you know, what we do at Great Scott Gadgets is like building tools to support education. Um, and uh, so I'm really enthusiastic about software defined radio and all the things that we can do with SDR. And uh, that was kind of a, some of the background behind this, and, and Kate's into that stuff too. Um, so, you know, software-defined radio is one example of software-defined things. We also have kind of all sorts of weird stuff like software-defined networking happening now, and it's just sort of in general, it's a software-defined thing is specialized stuff made without specialized hardware or specialized software, right? Right, and so this, this name kind of comes from, from our perspective, from a very specific technology, which was kind of the introduction to software-defined radio, or software-defined yeah, things, yeah. which is software-defined radio. And, and specifically, we're, we're kind of taking our title for this talk from software-defined radio, not from things like software-defined networking. In software-defined radio, we specifically have this sort of sampling of a real-world signal and then processing a waveform in digital land, doing digital signal processing, and then being able to like spit that signal out Your and HDMI just my HDMI just dropped. Nice. That's exciting. Uh, and uh, so what you would be seeing if we had video right now uh, is a picture is Do a picture of the... HackRF1, uh, which is just one example of a software-defined radio platform. We happen to like it because like I designed it, um, but <laughs> But, um, yeah, I don't know what's go. going on here. Oh, okay. Ah, nice, okay. So, uh, but really we're not talking about software-defined radio. It's just an example of the kind of thing that inspired this talk is uh, it truly, actually, uh, I, I kind of take issue with this slide because, because so we're going to start arguing already. Uh, because technically, a software-defined radio actually is something, is a radio that's built out of software. And it may have a hardware component like this platform, this peripheral called HackRF, but the, the essential elements of what make this, make a ra the radio like function as a particular type of device, like function as your garage door opener, is actually software running on the computer connected to this thing. So the HackRF or whatever other software-defined radio platform you use is a component in a software-defined radio, but the thing that makes it software-defined is the software, not the hardware. Right, and if you go to the next slide, the really cool thing that has come from the software-defined radio movement is not even the broad variety of software-defined radio hardware, but the software that supports it. I mean, they don't call it hardware-defined radio, but this software, especially GNU Radio and especially GNU Radio Companion, is software that allows you to do advanced digital signal processing things in a really easy visual GUI-based language, which means that you can actually model data flow as things that look like data flow. You don't have to know how to program software to do things that are DSP. You don't even have to know that it's DSP in order to do DSP. Right. So we're going to show you today a bunch of things that are kind of in very atypical use cases that are enabled by the stuff that was built for software-defined radio. And we've actually used other tools besides GNU Radio uh, for this kind of stuff, but today we're just going to do a bunch of demos in GNU Radio because we think it's the uh, most compelling piece, you know, single piece of software that is a huge toolkit that allows a whole bunch of different things. Uh, so we're going to start with a demo that is uh, using, do, should I do a thing? 
Should I do it? Should I advance the slides or should yeah, I? Yeah, if you want to, you want to go to this and start. You want to start that. I'm we can talk about it the and then we can go into the. Okay, I'm gonna figure out the how to photos start the demo. Of this. this is gonna be uh, this one. That's the one, right? Sure. Okay. So what we are gonna do now is we have here sitting on the table a light sensor. We'll show you a picture of in a minute, and we're just capturing the essentially the signal that is coming from that using a great fat yeah. analog output here dumped right onto your screen. And it's not very interesting looking because the ambient light level in here is pretty steady. However, if you look really, really closely, you might notice it just wiggling up and down a little bit. And one of the cool things that GNU Radio lets us do is instead of doing this time domain display like an oscilloscope, it lets us do a frequency domain display like a spectrum analyzer. And you see there's this big DC spike in the middle, which we can kind of ignore. But then you see this interesting thing over here at 120 hertz. That's actually the modulation of the light sources that are in this room. And can we get the lights dimmed for a moment? Watch this peak under my mouse cursor here. Maybe we'll see something interesting happen. Lots. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah. So this, it this, went up! This is an automatically scaled sensor. Those <laughs> LED lights don't operate at 60 hertz. It's yeah. one of the others, I think, over so, here. So now we're picking up more of the 60 hertz because it's not getting drowned out by, the, by what, however these lights are pulsed. Neat. We have so a this house is, like this is cool. You see this at 120 hertz or 0.12 kilohertz because you have the 60 hertz. That is an upswing and a downswing. So we're getting twice that here. If you want to turn on the That's really spinning cool. light. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what we have here is a small spinning light, as you might see on a variety of vehicles that may or may not be harassing you at the time. And so kind of an interesting thought is we have this light sensor. And this light sensor is something that is something we could do some analysis on in the time domain. If we point it at this, we can even kind of see, let me get this. We can kind of see those pulses there as this thing spins. It kind of makes sense. If you see that thing physically spinning, it's actually just a little light bulb that's being blocked by a piece of reflective metal periodically. And in the time domain, we can kind of see on this graph that sometimes the light's not there. But if we switch to the frequency domain, what you can actually see if you zoom in there is really close to the center. You might want to zoom out a little more. That's I, there we go. Oh, there we go. Uh, it had to update because I put so many FFT bins. Mm. But so what we're actually seeing is a frequency domain analysis of all of the light in the room right now, including that spinning light. So if you want to detect someone who has one of these flashing lights, you can build something that has a simple frequency domain analysis and tells you if something is spinning at about those two hertz, those two cycles per second. So if you want to know if someone is now coming to harass you with a spinning light, you can actually go and take your light sensor, point it out your window and see, yes, okay, we have a spinning blue light here that's spinning at about the frequency we expect. And really it took a while to update uh, because I set the FFT size so high and my sample rate is fairly low, but you can now see that all those peaks that were detected uh, from of the, the rate of rotation of this thing have dropped out. So you put this down. A really we, cool thing that we experimented with in the lab is if we had more than one of these lights, which we should have had Amazon actually deliver a second one. Yeah, Amazon lied to us, but we were supposed to have another one of these, have these delivered to the hotel yesterday. As you add more lights, the interference present between the lights, as they are all slightly not synchronized with each other, actually tells you how many of them there are. So if you have like four of these, you can actually see a little shift in the frequency domain as that little tiny lobe you have of that moves over. And looking at the shape of that, you can actually say, hmm, it seems like there's like four of these. Yeah. And in theory, you could even pin pinpoint like the, the precise uh, frequency of one versus another. However, since their frequency of rotation is so slow, it's like two hertz, like, uh, you know, coming up with subtle differences uh, kind of requires a, a fairly long lived capture. Uh, but it is possible. Uh, and so, should we move on? Yeah, our, our, oh, oh, this is actually this is the picture of the light sensor. The light we sensor using. we just used. And so, the platform we're using to do this demo uh, is Great Fat One, which is uh, a thing that we make that is a sort of a uh, an embedded development platform with a slightly different model. Instead of doing 
embedded development where you're like writing firmware for the thing. We try to support peripheral development where you're, you're plugging the thing in and it exposes all these outside uh, connections to Python on your host computer. Uh, and, and so we're using that for rapid development here. And I've made this little add-on board uh, called a neighbor, uh, Ursinia. Uh, so there's a neighbor, Ursinia is on top, and it's a Grove base. Uh, this is a new neighbor that I just designed recently. And it's just a convenient way for us to plug in a bunch of external things. Uh, and one of those external things that we're using right now is this little light sensor that Kate had in her drawer and came from Adafruit. Yes, yeah, so this is just a little commercial sensor that was made by you know, made for makers. It cost like three dollars. It is not at all a specialized sensor. We had it around. I plugged it into this, and without doing too much more, we were able to take that data and plop it into GNU Radio. Yeah. And that enabled us to do things like that frequency domain analysis. Is the flowchart there? Uh, uh, no, I don't see the flowchart. Oh, you want to switch over to? Oh, here's that's, that's the, the next, next flowchart. Do oh, we don't have that flow graph in there. Because there's only two blocks in it. You want that's to switch right. over to? There's only two blocks in it. Um, but if you want to look at it again, uh, it's kind of hard to see because of the font size. But there's really only two blocks, this one that I'm wiggling around and this one that I'm wiggling around. Right. So we added the capability to grab things from GreatFet. That's one block there. So this is just a source that dumps data from the GreatFet's ADC into GNU Radio. And all we're doing there is visualizing that. So we actually get all of that data that's coming in from the ADC piped into this DSP system for free. And then any analysis you want to do, you can do in software at that point using this kind of flow graph metaphor that GRC, Green Radio Companion, provides. All right. uh, but we can, we can sample things other than the ADC, using the ADC. Uh, we can also interface with all sorts of digital things. So let me fire up our next demo, which is a slightly more complicated flow graph that is bringing in some data from this touch sensor, which is an I2C device. Uh, so we're still just a little simple device plugged in through the Great Fet, um, but this time instead of sampling an analog signal, uh, we're asking the the squared C device for information periodically. Uh, should I run it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and in this case, we're using audio output, so you know you might need to cover your ears. We'll see how loud this is. Uh, not very loud. Okay, I'm going to turn up the volume. There we go. Can you hear that? So this is the most basic way of kind of making this visualization into something that we can hear. If you want to, you can take sensors and produce crazy musical things using GNU Radio because it is a general signal processing toolkit. So in this case, we're just driving a frequency, uh, in this case, like an FM modulator based on the position. But the really cool thing is you're actually getting a purely digital signal. There's no analog thing here that's sitting in a sensor that's accessed via I2C. So it's a sensor you usually talk to digitally. We are taking that, grabbing data from that sensor, and dumping it into GNU Radio so you can do signal processing with it. And so we have this kind of zoom in on our flow graph here. Maybe you can actually read this one. Uh, and so you can see on the left, we have, we have an I2C register source. Uh, which is a new block that Kate wrote for GNU Radio, um, and it's an astonishingly small amount of code entirely in Python. Uh, we're using GNU Radio 3.8 because 3.8, which is brand new, supports Python 3, finally, yay! And uh, we like Python 3, and we're just about ready to kick Python 2 out the door. And uh, we're, uh, and so she, she made like this ADC block, and she made this I2C block. Uh, we can make other blocks. Uh, and each one is, is like a really s small amount of code. Right, and so all this is doing is grabbing that, taking it and stretching, basically adding samples to the point where it's at the same frequency as the speakers, and then frequency modulating it and outputting it there. So you get a, essentially a sine wave whose frequency varies with your position on this digital slider. Right, and so we can play with with doing like things with high speed data streams if we want to, um, or and we can play with all kinds of digital signal processing things. We can also play with actuators. Uh, we're we're only showing sources, not sinks. So we're showing data getting pumped by the Great Fet into GNU Radio. We can do the same thing in reverse, but we're not doing that because we only have so much time today. And so our actuator for today is uh, audio output. Right, which is a little bit nicer for people who are listening to recordings of this who can actually see the stuff we're doing. Good point. So We planned that. And this is not the only sensor we can work with. 
Uh, so. Yeah, we, we have other sensors. Like, I was playing with this uh, accelerometer not too long ago, and, um, and, I, and I was trying to get it working with a great fed, and I started getting it working with a great fed. And, and actually, before I even had Kate's fancy block to bring it into GNU Radio, I was noticing that, hey, this thing can sample pretty fast. And like even just naively, even just like one line of Python from my host computer, just saying, give me a reading. It gave me a reading. And then I'm like, OK, put that in a for loop and give me like 10,000 readings. And I got like like 3,000 samples per second just like naively doing that without even like running anything in firmware or, or any, using any of Kate's code that's doing it the right way. And so just doing it the wrong way, I was like, hey, like 3,000 samples per second, I, I, bet, I bet I could get some audio and so, so I apologize to uh, people who were nearby at the time. I, um, I started sampling the thing, and I leaned over and just uh, like an inch away from it, just shouted at the top of my lungs. And I actually got uh, almost intelligible audio. And I was like, this, I was so excited. And I was like looking around the lab for something to, to like make it better, uh, so that you know, uh, turning this thing into a microphone. And I, and I was like. <laughs> I found this party balloon, and I, I took this Mylar party balloon, and I, and I got the packing tape from the warehouse, and I just like taped the thing, this dev board, onto the balloon, and I started yelling at it, and I actually did get intelligible audio. You can hear me say like, one, two, three. And uh, I, the balloon lasted for exactly one test. Uh, tur turns out you should desolder the pin headers before you tape the thing excitedly onto the balloon. Um, but it, it did last for one test, which was super awesome. Yeah, and so we're just collaborating at this point, I think, over IRC. Oh, yeah, we were on IRC, home. and I was, I was like, giving her the play-by-play, -play, like, hey, I can yell at it, and I can, get, I can hear my voice. And she's like, we should totally use this as a musical instrument pickup. And I was like, ding, I have this toy guitar. And, but now they can at least say that Mike has yelled at a balloon until it popped, so that's something that I <laughs> cherish from this. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, this is totally not the first time in my life I have shouted at electronics. Um, but it may have been the first time it had the intended effect. Uh, so I've taken the same accelerometer board with the pin headers removed uh, and added this uh, I2C uh, cable and we just need to plug it in. To... I don't think I've tested this port before. We'll find out if it works. <laughs> Did I make the Arsenia correctly? I've tested that one. Oh, have okay. you? Oh, all right. Uh, and so this is what it looks like uh, close up, uh, just like posing near my guitar. Uh, but I have it strapped on uh, near the bridge, kind of about where it is in this photo. Um, and so I should be able to run a flow graph here. Uh, now this is going to be really interesting because we have no idea what this is going to do with the sound system in here. It's, this is great. I'm super excited. Um, I want to do... Guitar. Okay, so w I've made this little flow graph that kind of emulates a, a guitar amplifier, um, which keeps getting more complicated every time I play with it. Yeah, we sat down at the hotel last night, and it was just basically audio with a little bit of clipping. And there, as we went through this, it was just getting more and more so as we were just sitting there getting oh, more I don't and more think, guitar. I don't think I'm getting data. Oh no, what's happening? Let's just restart the great fit. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, you, we were going to restart the great fit, weren't we? We forgot. There might be, we might have bugs. It's possible. I, at this point, neurotically restart everything before I start any demo because I don't trust anything. Oh, there anything. we go. There we go. There, there we, we go. go. Okay, so if I turn up the volume to 11 or something, can you hear that like through the speakers? Is that coming out? Can we get a little more volume, Is maybe? Is your also mixer turned away? Oh, I can, I, can, I can do yeah, my also I mixer. I can turn that up. Oh, there we go. Maybe? Yeah? I should hear some. No, there we go. There we okay. Go. Now, it's a little nasty sounding. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. There we go. I'm actually going to turn this down a little bit. I'm probably uh, a little far into the red there. But that's, that's pretty good. But like, I should be able. Can we get it adjusted so like you can hear it now? Okay, so it doesn't sound great. 
right? I'm only sampling at 6,000 samples per second, which means like I'm not getting much high frequency content, but like there's this time honored tradition among electric guitarists to introduce high frequency content um, in the form of distortion, in the form of clipping. Uh, so I'm gonna turn out my preamp here instead of my post and like see if we can get, All right? All right. This calls for a great Scott Gadget's uh, guitar pick. Gentlemen, 3,000, 6,000 samples per second. So we're sitting there in the hotel last night, just kind of grinning at this. So we're sitting there in the hotel last night, kind of grinning at this, oh, yeah. and we decided that simple clipping wasn't enough for that electric guitar oh, sound. Oh, yeah. And so we were sitting there, like, just we were, like, gradually we could, adding we blocks add to the radio. And so, like, these two, these two blocks down at the bottom right here are just adding a little reverb, uh, which is, in, like, in the most naive way we could possibly think of, and it just it kind of sounded good. Um, <laughs> Uh, so like, anyway, I'm just gonna wear that because I'm just I'm just gonna break it if I take it off. Uh, if you uh, if you go through this flow graph a little bit, I think I have a slide for this, right? Do we have a slide for this? Do I know how to use my laptop? There we go. Uh, so without the reverb, it's really pretty simple. Like I was kind of amazed that it did not take much to model an electric guitar amp in GNU Radio and like make it. <laughs> fun to play, because uh, it's super fun to play. Uh, so we have this I2C register source, like the same thing, same exact source we use for this little touch slider. Uh, and then we're just like blocking the DC component, which is like the fixed, like mostly gravity probably, like that is affecting the sensor. And, uh, and then visualizing it in the frequency domain, that's over on the right hand side. Uh, and then we're just resampling it. So we're changing it from the six ish uh, kilosamples per second up to 48 kilosamples per second, which is what my sound card runs at. Uh, and then all I'm doing is multiplying the, the signal value, just scaling it up according to my preamp slider, and then railing it, like clipping it at plus one or minus one, uh, and then scaling it up again according to my post gain slider, and then dumping it into the sound card. That was it. So that is all we're doing, have other you seen than the reverb. magazine? descriptions of like how to build things like clipping circuits. That's one block in your radio. Yeah. Uh, and so just to show you again uh, kind of what this, uh, what this looks like, the clipping, uh, if you look at this waveform, the time domain waveform across the middle of the screen, you see how there's the blue curve and the red curve? The blue curve is showing like what the signal would be doing if it weren't clipping, and the red signal is showing the actual clipped signal. It turns it into square waves. It adds a bunch of higher frequency components and makes that wonderful, uh, ridiculous distortion that we all love. So if we have the time, I don't know if we do. Uh, do you want to try one more thing? Is this software Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the cool things is that, like, uh, uh, yeah, we should just keep this running. Uh, one of the cool things is that I was like, oh, I need to, some fancy way to attach it to my guitar. And Kate was like, just strap it on with a rubber band. And it totally worked. But it's sort of interesting because, like, uh, uh, can we get audio again? Can you play that for us? Okay. So, like, we can totally play the guitar or, or we can play the rubber band. So in the spirit of software defined everything, uh, just before our talk, we found an everything. And let's 
We have not tried this box. We've tried other boxes. Yeah, well, I'm going to do a little bit of experimentation here. So we're taking an accelerometer and strapping it to a cardboard box here. And this is not the craziest part of our talk. <laughs> is it not? Well, we'll see. OK, do we have? Oh, wait. Oh, there's. Nothing in this demo has been anything more than sensors and actuators dumped into GNU Radio. But, so this is all stuff that is just regular, viable commercial accelerometers, light sensors, things like that. We are taking all this stuff and doing all of the magic in software. Yeah, and, and we're not the first person, people to do the, like making a, pick, a, a musical instrument pick up out of an accelerometer. There's actually this, this cool post uh, by Analog Devices. They did it much better than we did. Uh, like, at, notably, they did it at a much higher sample rate, which is cool. Um, but we did it at a sample rate that's fun. So it, it was <laughs> good enough, I think. Uh, and we've put all the code and demos for this online. Um, most of it is in the GreatFet repo, uh, but the actual flow graphs, the, those, those uh, GNU radio companion flow graphs that we use today uh, are in uh, Kate's presentation repo, which you can see up there. And I've been working on capturing the data that we've been using from things like the various sensors into that repository. Hopefully, we'll capture the accelerometer as well, which means oh, you yeah. can, without any of this hardware, download that, not even a great fat, download those pre-captured files and play with them yourself. So if you want to go and do crazy audio effects on top of Mike's guitar playing, that right. is something that you can, at home, go download this software and do. Uh, and I don't know if we have time for questions. Do we? We have time for questions. Does anybody have a question? Wow. I mean, this talk raises several questions. <laughs> <laughs> 